This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. We welcome you to our worship this day. If you're worshiping with us online at First Presbyterian Church in Granbury, Texas, we're glad that you're here and hope that as we worship today that uh, you'll fully participate in, in what we do as we gather in God's presence and gather together even though we're distanced. We're glad that you're here today. Want to give you a couple of announcements I hope you make note of. Uh, sacred Space for the last month, we've been doing that Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, beginning immediately. We'll do it just on Thursday at noon. So if you're planning to join us for a time of quiet and devotion, a little bit of music, uh, for Sacred Space to be here in this Sacred Space, remember it's only on Thursday at noon now. So we invite you to come and hope that you will. If you've not yet signed up for flu shots, uh, do remember that we're having a flu shot clinic on Wednesday, the 23rd of September. If you'd like to do that, simply call Shanna in the church office or email her. She'll send you the paperwork and we can get all that filled out beforehand so that we'll be ready and be able to move folks through. We will be careful as we distance folks and uh, call you into the fellowship hall when we do that to make sure that we keep our distance. But hope that you'll get your flu shot. Important this year that you do that. So if you've not lined up for your flu shot yet, we hope that you will do that. The nominating committee is busy at work and have now spread out to extend the call to several folks that uh, we hope will serve as elders. Hope that you'll keep the committee and all those that are being asked in prayer and that if you are one that's asked that you prayerfully consider uh, our request to be able to put your name forward uh, to serve as ruling elder as we move into the new year. Uh, it's always an important task, an important job, and uh, we look forward to finding out who our slate will be and hope that you'll prayerfully hold up the committee and those being asked as we move toward that. This morning, our moment for silence is an opportunity to remember Elaine Sparks. Elaine was a uh, a marvelous spirit, a great smile. She was always a cheery person to be near, and we celebrate her life on this day as we remember her with a moment of silence and light the candle in honor of her. We're grateful that she has completed her baptism and rests in the presence of the one who is her Lord and Savior. And as we give thanks to God, we celebrate that she knows the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus and we give thanks to God for the goodness of her life. So this morning as we begin our worship, I will light the candle. Hope that you'll take a moment of silence to remember Elaine, to offer prayers for her family, and then our worship will begin with the organ prelude.
What a beautiful way to begin our worship. Let us now continue our worship. I'd invite you to stand and join me in the call to worship. Our God is majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, and worthy of our highest praise. Who is like the Lord? Our God blew back the waters, prepared a path through the sea, and appeared as a pillar of fire to light the pilgrim way. Who is like the Lord? The Lord is our strength and our salvation. Let us sing to the Lord who triumphs gloriously. Amen. Our God, who is the sculptor of the mountains, is the God of grace, the God of forgiveness. Let us, before God and together, confess our sins, that we may know God's forgiveness, that we may dwell in Christ's grace. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we are quick to ask for grace when we have fallen short for your patience when we have stubbornly turned away from you, why are we slow to show the same mercy to others? We keep track of wrongs and cling to old hurts rather than offering the forgiveness that could free others and ourselves. We strive to be more faithful, Lord. We want to be more loving. So we kneel before you once again to ask for patience and grace Transform us, we pray. Pour out your mercy upon us until it flows forth from us through acts of love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. If a person is in Christ, they become a new creation altogether. Behold, the past is finished and it's gone. 
Friends, believe the good news of the gospel in the waters of our baptism and in the grace of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. offers us the peace of a forgiving heart. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord, we come here to worship you. Wherever we are, may you fill the place Wherever we are, may you clear our minds. Wherever we are, may you assuage our fears or our worries. Lord, bring us to full attention to your word read and preached today. May we learn something new of you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our first reading is from Romans 14, verses 1 through 12. Listen for the word of the Lord. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Waco, uh-huh. What happened to my little picture frame? It got broke. It, it got broke. Did uh huh? How did that happen? I think it fell off the wall, but it wasn't on the wall. Oh, so what do you think happened to my little picture frame? Lucky did it. Lucky the dog did it. Uh huh. Lucky the dog was not playing with the little picture frame. Come on, what happened to it? It was Lily the crocodile. Uh huh. Except this happened yesterday, and Larry is still at a sleepover with his cousins. Oh. Come on. Who did it? I did it. Oh, sweetie, why didn't you just tell me? I was afraid. Afraid? Uh-huh. Now, Waco, what do we always say at this house? We always say, people first, things next. People first, 
things second. That's right. People first, things second. You know, it's just a picture frame. I I can fix it. That that that. Waco. Let's talk about forgiveness. Okay. Okay. There's a really wonderful story um, in today's gospel that Brenda just read us. Did, were you listening? I don't think so. I didn't think so either. It's about this king and a man owed him a large debt. Remember last week we talked about debt. What you owe, what you owe. Well, the man came to the king and he said, Oh, please, oh, please have mercy on me and I will pay you what I owe you. And the king said, Okay. So the man went out and he found someone who owed him some, him some money. And he said, pay me what you owe me. And the man said, oh, please have mercy on me and I will repay what I owe. So what do you think the first man did? Did he forgive him? No, he choked him and he threw him down and he threw him in prison. That's terrible. I know. And then when the king heard about it, he called the man in and said, all I ask was that you forgive someone the same way that I forgave you. Let me tell you a story. Okay. When I was a little girl, we had foster children. What is that? Well, it's children who, for one reason or another, can't stay with their parents, and so they stay with another family for a while. Uh Uh-huh. And we had this little girl, and her name was Tammy Kay. And Tammy Kay was always so afraid that she was going to be punished because I think she'd been punished a lot. And so every time something happened, even the smallest thing, she would say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry don't matter, sorry don't matter, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What? She would say, I'm sorry, sorry don't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, but she was just a little girl. And I think it's because someone had continuously told her, it doesn't matter how sorry you are because sorry doesn't help. Well, that's terrible. It was terrible. She was a little girl that no one had ever forgiven, and so she couldn't seem to forgive herself either. Who broke the picture frame? I broke the picture frame. You broke the picture frame. Well, what do you say? I'm sorry. It's okay, Waco. It's okay because I can fix the picture frame. People first, things second. I think this in the story today about the king and the man he forgave, we're supposed to see ourselves because we all do bad things. We do, yes, I do bad things. Last night, I did a bad thing. I got very, very angry at the dog. Did you hurt him? No, I didn't hurt him, but he was barking in the middle of the night and I was so angry because it's very hard for me to sleep. And once I get to sleep, it's very hard for me to get back to sleep. So I was so angry. This morning, it was hard for me to forgive myself for yelling at that poor dog. He was just doing what dogs do. Forgiveness is not a one-way street. Forgiveness is a two-way street. We forgive, and in the same way, we are forgiven. God has forgiven us all of our sins. All we have to do is admit that we did them, and we are forgiven. But in the same way, we are supposed to forgive others. I think the dog forgives me. You think so? Yeah. As I was coming out to the studio, he he was very anxious for me to pet him and play with him. So I think he forgives me. Dogs know a lot about forgiveness. We are supposed to forgive others the way we are forgiven. And the other important thing is people first, things second, things second. Okay? Okay. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. For forgiving me. Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. And I will do my best. And I will do my best to forgive others. To forgive others. Amen. 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 The Gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter, the 21st through the 35th verses. As Paul has written to the Romans, reminding those in the church at Rome not to be judgmental of one another, to recognize the differences 
between those with whom we live, reminding us that God is the one who judges. So now Jesus talks a bit about how that judgment looks when we need forgiveness for ourselves and for one another. So listen carefully as Matthew lays out these words from Jesus. Listen for God's word. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. Now when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever and ever. This is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Roger Levette tells the story of a trip he took to Scotland several years ago. He arrived in Stirling. Now, Stirling is northeast of Edinburgh, and it's the gateway to the Scottish Highlands. It's where Robert the Bruce fought to gain Scotland's independence in 1314. It's the basis for the film Braveheart. Now, the city is dominated by a castle high on a hill overlooking the entire landscape. And near that castle rests the Church of the Holy Rood. The Holy Rood was a medieval term that was used to explain the cross of Christ's crucifixion. The Holy Rood was that cross on which Christ was crucified. The church dates to the 12th century. Mary, Queen of Scots, was crowned there in 1543. Prince Henry was christened in that same church in 1594. James VI was crowned king in that same room. There's history galore that happened in that ancient building near the highlands of Scotland. The Church of the Holy Rood. Now, on a tour of Stirling, Levette listened to the tour guide as he told the church's story. And he stopped everybody in the midst of the church and says, do you see that brick line that runs through the church? And he pointed to a line from the ceiling to the floor all the way across and all the way back up the other side. 
Then the guide continued. He said, this line tells the story of one of our most painful episodes. During the turbulent 17th century, he explained, when there were so many religious and political troubles, this congregation split into factions. An extreme and bigoted Presbyterian pastor, I didn't know there'd ever been one of those, named James Guthrie, refused to accept his more moderate comrade. After trying to resolve the conflict time and time again, the town council finally decided that the only solution was to put up a brick wall from east to west all the way across the sanctuary and to separate the two factions of the church into two different churches. And so in 1656, they literally divided the sanctuary. One church became two separate churches, meeting between the same walls on the east and the west. They worshiped back to back from 1656 until 1936. One altar was placed at one end of the building. Another altar was placed at the other end of the building. They worshiped the same God in the same building divided by the same wall. And the wall stood there for 280 years. 280 years they worshiped back to back in that place, in that church of the Holy Rood. Now one wonders how many times in that 280 years did those worshipers on both sides of that wall repeat the Lord's Prayer Sunday after Sunday intoning for everyone to hear those familiar words, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And yes, this was Scotland, so it was debts and debtors in a good way. How disheartening it is to realize that sometimes the church is the least likely place for us to find forgiveness. Sometimes that's the case, but one not need to go back to the 17th century, nor does one need to go to Scotland to find similar situations. When my grandfather was pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Plainview, Texas in the early 1960s, two factions broke out in that church. I served that church as pastor for 12 years myself. I knew the history of it well. The church split and those that were unhappy with what was going on took their membership and began another church across town. I've always thought that it was ironic a bit that the name of the church they chose was Grace Presbyterian Church. But they did split. And while I was there, not by any big doing of mine, but the two churches reunited. After 40 years apart, they came back together. Now I thought there was a nice bit of, of poetry to that. 40 years is a good biblical number. It's a good long time to be apart from one another. It felt a bit poetic. It also felt like forgiveness. It was a joyous occasion. But it didn't take long after the church began to worship again, these folks that hadn't worshiped together in 40 years, to understand the deep divisions that existed. And for me to realize the challenge of the reality that forgiveness was still needed by those folks in that place. Decades after the split, four decades after the split, there were still feelings that were raw. There were still feelings that were difficult to talk about. We love to hold tightly to that which separates us at the expense of celebrating the things that unite us. It must surely grieve our Savior when we behave that way. Now Matthew picks up a conversation about forgiveness, <clears throat> continues a conversation that I believe we began last week talking about what do you do when you have conflict in the life of the church. It's a natural outgrowth of that if you're going to talk about conflict at some point in order to heal that, we must talk about forgiveness and how forgiveness functions. It's not a discussion that's addressed at any of us in particular, but it's a discussion that's addressed to all of us. 
Because at some point or another, we either are required to forgive someone else or we long for that forgiveness ourselves. And just as what Jesus had to say about conflict in the church was specific for the church but had a much broader application, so does what Jesus has to say about forgiveness apply to the church but has a much broader application outside the doors of the church. It's not solely directed toward the church. And here again, and it won't surprise you, Peter is that wonderful character who breaks into the scene as Peter so often does. When Jesus needs the disciples to know who he is and he asks the question, who do people say that I am? It's Peter that jumps up and says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then he proceeds very quickly to make clear that he doesn't really understand what it was he just said. He would later, but not now. And when the waters are rough and the disciples are scared and the boat is being tossed about on the sea and they see Jesus coming to them on the waters, who's the first one out of the boat? It's Peter. Peter gets out and he starts walking to Jesus and then Peter sinks like his namesake, like a rock, as soon as he figures out that he's on the waters and he's not supposed to be able to do that. And when Peter ascends the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus is there transfigured before him, it's Peter who doesn't understand this transformative moment, but who wants to build three booths to capture this scene and to keep it that way so that Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are caught in the moment to transform no more to be transfigured no more. Peter is always there for Matthew to give him a good foil in the midst of the story as he tells his tales. So right after Jesus has given some good advice about how to deal with church members when you feel wronged by one of them, Peter again is at the center of the stage. This time he asks a good and valid question, surely. Lord, if a member of the church sins against me, how many times should I forgive? And then Peter jumps in to show Jesus that he's been thinking deeply about this subject. He offers an answer, seven times? Now Peter thinks he's being pretty generous here. The rabbis say you should forgive three times. See, our, our tradition of three strikes and you're out has a long, a long history based in the faith. Three times seems to be the Jewish standard, so Peter figures he's going to be magnanimous and, and more than double three times what the rabbis say, but leave it to Jesus to expect more. And Jesus says, no, not seven times, 77 times. In some translations, some ancient manuscripts indicate seven times 70. And so while Peter is getting his head wrapped around that and doing the math to realize that means 490 times I've got to forgive someone, Jesus tells a parable about a merciful king and an unforgiving servant who failed to offer to someone else what he had so generously accepted from his king. He failed to share the same mercy that he himself had known. And in the end, Jesus' answer is really fairly simple. How many times do we forgive someone who has wronged us? As many times as it takes to get the job done. That's the Jesus standard. Peter didn't need to do the math. He just needed to hear the punchline. As many times as it takes. Forgiveness is at the center of this faith we share. Each week we gather together and worship either in this place or online. We gather together as the church to be reminded that by the mercy of God and the grace of Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. It is the reminder of worship. Our experience of that forgiveness and of that grace is as individual and as different as each one of us is. 
And together we celebrate the salvific nature of that forgiveness in the language of our prayers, in the language of our hymns, in the language of our liturgy, in the language of our hearts. We celebrate that forgiveness. But the challenge of our faith is not the celebration of forgiveness. As important as that is, as part of our living faith, surely. But the challenge of our faith is modeling that forgiveness not only in the church but in a world out there that longs for forgiveness and needs to know it. The challenge of the faith is to forgive as we have been forgiven. Jesus is making the point that if we are going to model that forgiveness in the world about us, then we begin that modeling in the community of faith, in the life of the church first. The faith is known in this place. The faith is lived in the world beyond these walls. The longing for forgiveness does not exist only in the life of the church. If forgiveness is an issue for the communal life of the church, it is a communal issue because it is an individual issue for those of us who gather and worship. It is a concern for the church because the church is filled with people like you and like me. And that's why we talk about it. It's a need that we can meet within the faith. We're recording this service on September the 11th, recording it on Friday before it occurs on your screens Sunday morning. This is the 19th anniversary of the events of September 11 that took almost 3,000 lives of our fellow countrymen and countrywomen that altered and changed in drastic ways the lives, lives of so many others. And on this day, we hear chants of never forget, which is a good thing, not to forget. Not to forget. But we choose not to forget, not so that we can foment the anger and the hatred that we felt that day and that many would like to continue to feel, but so that we might remember well those whose lives were lost and those whose lives were so changed. That's why we remember. And on this day, surely, it behooves us to remember the unity that we share as a nation and as a people, the commonality that we hold together. Interesting that traditionally, when political campaigns are going along, on September 11th, they pull their media ads, the acrimony and the mean-spirited kind of mudsling that we've grown accustomed to in the political world for just a day. They pull them so that we might focus on our oneness as a nation rather than the divisive language that we so often use in political campaigns for just a day to remind ourselves of our unity. They will return tomorrow in full force. But for today, perhaps we'll skip them. This election of ours is only two months away. I think it does us well at this moment in time as a nation to remember Jesus' words about forgiveness. I worry when I see and hear the things that neighbors are saying about one another, are saying to one another, about assumptions that we're all making about those on the other side, 
And I hope that when all this is said and done, and the dust settles, and the campaigns are over, and we move forward as a nation, as we will, that we'll remember those things that are uniting and not those things that are discordant and cause fraction amongst us. And I hope and pray that we'll consider this Jesus tale about forgiveness, that we'll remember these lessons that he taught about forgiveness, because I think we're going to need those words to mend what seems very broken. We're going to need those words. It won't surprise any of you that have listened to me very often that uh, I'm going to quote Frederick Beekner again. Because so often I think Beekner has a way of taking scripture and making it so concise and understandable. This is what Frederick Beekner has to say about forgiveness. When somebody you've wronged forgives you, you're spared the dull and self-diminishing throb of a guilty conscience. When you forgive someone who has wronged you, you're spared the dismal corrosion of bitterness and wounded pride. For both parties, forgiveness means the freedom again to be at peace inside their own skins and to be glad in each other's presence. Hear that again. Forgiveness means the freedom to be at peace inside their own skins and to be glad in each other's presence. Surely that's what God intends for our lives. Surely that is what God intends for Christ's church. Is it not what God intends for the world also that we might be at peace in our own skins and be glad in each other's presence no matter how many times it takes for us to get there? It's a word to the church. It's a word for our world. It's a word for us. Let's spread the word. Amen.
Let us now stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, you drove the sea back by your holy might so that your people could walk on dry land to safety on the opposite shore. You brought your people, faithless though they often were, to a land you promised them, a land flowing with milk and honey. Even still, your people failed to acknowledge your power and because of fear refused to go forth into this land you had promised. So you continued to guide your people with fire and cloud. For 40 years you led them, in their joy, in their sorrow, in their faithfulness, in their defiance, in their courage, and in their fear. You remained the same. You fed their, hungry, their hunger for food and for you. You slaked their thirst for water and the word. Finally, when that generation was gone, you brought their children into the land you had promised. Great is your faithfulness, O God, in the past and in the present. Even the future has already been set, and it portrays your faithfulness as well. We humbly come before you to ask that you would give us wisdom instead of fear, that you would give us understanding instead of doubt, that you would give us boldness to utilize our gifting and your blessings all for your glory and the furtherance of your kingdom. May our hard hearts not hinder your timing, O Lord. May we not wander aimlessly. Make us sure and solid instruments of your peace. God of all comfort, please be with all of those suffering from ravaging fires, protect them. Those recovering from the destruction of hurricanes, encourage them. Those placing their lives on the line every day as they serve to be the first ones to run into danger as they help others to make it out of danger, embolden them. Those who are missing the first responders who have run into danger and never came back, be with them. Those who are treated unjustly, remind them they are yours. And those who act unjustly, reveal yourself to them. Turn their hearts. Please be with your church. May we have a calm assurance, even in the difficulties of life, because we know you. You are our God, the one in whom we place all our confidence. Rise your church up above the noise and confusion. Recast our eyes upward from the horizon of hatred and hardship that we see in front of us to the glory of your plan, your power, and your comforting assurance. Help us to rise above the droning confusion of the evil powers of darkness into your clear and perfect light. God of wholeness, be with all of your people who are suffering from illness, depression, isolation, 
conflict, abuse, self-hatred, disillusionment. Heal them, Lord. Show them who they are and whose they are. We pray also for wholeness for those near and dear to us who are facing physical illness at this time. We pray for Ed, Mary, JD, and Libby, for Wynette, Eloise, Jimmy, and Virginia, for Dave, Dee, Donna, and Diane, and for Kathleen, Stan, and CH. Heal all of those that have not been mentioned who are also experiencing ailments of various types. You are the healer, and we look to you for wholeness. Perfect Redeemer, we thank you for the life of Elaine Sparks and all of those we have lost during these past months of separation. We praise you for Elaine's relationship with you and with us at First Presbyterian Church. We know and celebrate that Elaine lives on eternally with you and that she has been reunited with all of those who have gone before her. Elaine has touched our lives. She will not be forgotten. We know that we shall see Elaine again because you have redeemed us all through the life and sacrifice of Jesus, your beloved son. Patient and forgiving judge, we know that we deserve nothing short of death because we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We recognize, but for your forgiveness, we would be lost. We know that you have called us to forgive those who have wronged us as well. Give us hearts that see beyond our own hurt. Give us the ability to see others as you see them. Make us gracious and loving, forbearing and patient, evermore being transformed into the likeness of the Christ who taught us and his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our final hymn. As we go out into the world from our worship together, might we remember the grace of forgiveness that we have received from God in Christ Jesus? And might we emulate that same forgiveness and grace for others 
that he who is our namesake, the Christ, might be shown to the world in the loving way that we have behaved because we have been loved, we have been graced, we have been forgiven. Surely it's a big challenge of the faith. Let us accept that challenge to be Christ's loving presence in this world of ours. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.